All right. Afternoon, everyone. I know we've still got some people coming in, so wait a, a couple more minutes uh, for the rest of the uh, the TAC to join here. All right, it's about two minutes past the hour and I think we've got majority of our TAC members now uh, on the phone. So they're online. So I want to uh, start the meeting and, and wish everyone good afternoon. Uh, call it to order and welcome everyone to the, uh, the regular meeting of the Los San Rail Quarter Agency Technical Advisory Committee being held virtually on Thursday, December 1st, 2022. Uh, as always, before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that due to every committee member uh, participating by Zoom in today's meeting, a roll call vote uh, will be required for attendance and for agenda items that require action by the committee. Also for the committee members and staff participating via Zoom, uh, please remember to mute yourself unless you're speaking. Uh, all TAC members should state for the record your name and agency. Uh, for all LOSAN staff, please state for the record your name and job title. And uh, members of the public uh, will be granted permission to speak during appropriate public comment opportunities on the agenda. Uh, at this time, I'd like to call roll, uh, beginning uh, with MTS. Do we have uh, anyone from MTS on the, the line? Brent Boyd is here. Hey, Brent. Uh, Sandag? Tim Briggs, Sandag, rail planner. Hey, Tim. Um, let's see, do we have uh, NCTD? Good afternoon, Katie Persons, NCTD. RCTC. Yeah, good afternoon, Sheldon Peterson, RCTC. Hey, Sheldon. Uh, for OCTA. Megan Taylor, OCTA. Hey, Megan. Uh, LA Metro. Good afternoon, Jay Furman, LA Metro. VCTC. Good afternoon, Aubrey Smith, VCTC. Aubrey. Claire Grasty here as well. There. Uh, SB CAG. Good afternoon, Aaron Bonfilio, SB CAG. Good afternoon, Aaron. And Slowcog. Hi, all. Tim Gillum, Slowcog. Uh, do we have anyone on from SCAG? Yes, Steve Fox. Hi, Steve. Uh, anyone on from Metrolink? 
think I see someone. Okay, yeah, I see someone in the attendees area. Okay, see that. Uh, high speed rail. Hey, James, Jerry, Romana. Hey, Jerry. Uh, from Amtrak. Uh, Kim Devine is here for him. Hey, Kim. Uh, anyone on from BNSF? I think I see Cindy in the attendees area. Oh, there she is. Yeah, James. Uh, Cindy's here. I'll start it out, and then Tamara will be joining as I will probably be leaving in a little bit. So. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Union Pacific. Hello, James. If you hear me, Vix down here. Yep, I hear you. Thank you. And anyone on from Caltrans? All right. So that takes us to, and obviously we have a quorum, so that takes us to item number one, public comments. Uh, Michelle, are there any public comments that have been received that are not on items on the agenda? At this time, members of the public may address the committee members regarding any items with the subject matter jurisdiction of the Technical Advisory Committee, but on action may be taken on agenda items unless authorized by law. Comments shall be limited to three minutes per speaker. To comment in real time, please raise hand to speak. You can find the raise hand icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're calling in by phone, press star nine to raise your hand and press star six to mute and unmute yourself. You may only speak once, once on each agenda item unless the committee decides to take additional comments. I will unmute callers who wish to speak one at a time. No comments, James. Great, thank you. So next is our special calendar and item number two, the proposed 2023 Technical Advisory Committee calendar. Uh, for the record, uh, James Campbell, Operations Officer for LOSAN. Uh, and in your packet should be the proposed schedule for the 2023 Technical Advisory Committee meetings. The draft calendar proposes eight regular TAC meetings uh, to be held the first Thursday of the months in which board meetings have been scheduled. Uh, due to potential conflicts around the Independence Day holiday, the proposed July meeting date is the second Thursday, uh, or proposed to be the second Thursday of that month. Uh, please note that the proposed meeting uh, time has been changed and reflects a meeting time of 1.15 p.m. to 2.45 p.m. to better align with the Pacific Surfliner schedules to and from Los Angeles, as it is anticipated that all TAC meetings in 2023, unless otherwise noted, uh, will be held in person in the LA Metro offices. Uh, meetings can also be added as, as always or, or canceled by the board chair uh, and staff uh, throughout the year as desired and appropriate. Uh, and then TAC meetings may also uh, be uh, canceled uh, some months if insufficient technical materials are available to present uh, or discuss. So at this time, uh, Los Angeles staff is seeking approval from the TAC on the proposed 2023 meeting calendar. Uh, and before I take a vote on that, are there any uh, questions or comments from TAC members on this item? Okay, not hearing any. Um, are there any uh, requests from the, the public on this item, Michelle? To comment in real time, please select raise hand to speak. If you're calling in by phone, press star nine to raise your hand. No comments, James. Right. So at this point, I'd like to ask for a motion and a second to approve the 2023 uh, TAC meeting calendar. This is Megan Taylor. I'll make a motion. Okay. The firm and Metro will second. Great. So at this time, uh, now take a roll call vote, uh, beginning with uh, Brent Boyd, MTS. Yes. 
Uh, Danny Vay, Sandag? Yes. 80 persons, NCTD? Yes. Sheldon Peterson, RCTC? Yes. Megan Taylor, OCTA? Yes. Jay Furman, LA Metro? Yes. Aubrey Smith, VCTC? Yes. Filio, SBCAG? Yes. And Tim Gillum, Slocog? Yes. Right. Motion passes. We have our calendar for next year. Um, that brings us to the consent calendar, items three and four. All matters on the consent calendar are to be approved in one motion unless a committee member or member of the public requests separate action on this item. Uh, do I have any questions or comments or requests to pull items from the committee members on the consent calendar? All right, hearing none. Uh, Michelle, do we have any requests from the public on the consent calendar? To comment in real time, please select raise hand to speak. If you're calling in by phone, press star nine to raise your hand. No comments, James. Thank you. That, uh, do we have a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar? Danny Vay Sandag, I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. Okay, thank you, Danny. I have a second. Jay Furman Metro will second. Okay. It's a motion by Danny Vay and a second by Jay Furman. Uh, we'll now take a roll call vote. Uh, Brent Boyd, MTS. Yes. Sandag, Danny Vay. Yes. Katie Persons, NCTD. Yes. Sheldon Peterson, RCTC. Yes. Megan Taylor, OCTA. Yes. Jay Furman, LA Metro. Yes. Aubrey Smith, VCTC. Yes. SBCAG. Yes. And Tim Gillum, Slocog. Uh, James, should I uh, abstain on number three, uh, approval of the minutes, since I wasn't there? Uh, you can abstain, uh, so we can count you as abstain. But can I support item four? Okay, I see what you mean. Um, uh, I believe, yes, we, we can put you down as abstaining for item three. Uh, yes on item four. Thank you. Okay. All right. That takes us, well, there are no regular calendar items uh, today. So this moves us to our discussion items. And our first item is item number five, a Central Coast Laro Facility Update. Uh, I will be providing uh, this update um, to the, uh, the TAC here. This item actually will also be going to the board uh, next Tuesday uh, for the certification of the environmental document. So this is a preview largely of the presentation that the board will also be uh, receiving. So Michelle, if you can go to the next slide. So a little bit of background first. Uh, the Central Coast Layover Facility is a project that began in 2019 with the site selection analysis and master site plan, uh, and for which we are now looking to wrap up the environmental clearance and preliminary engineering phase of. Uh, as proposed, the project uh, will expand uh, the capacity and capability of the maintenance facility at the northern terminus of the Pacific Surfliner Corridor in San Luis Obispo. The project site is roughly 13 acres in size and is located roughly a uh, half mile south of the existing San Luis Obispo train station on what is currently Union Pacific Railroad right away. Uh, next slide. The project as envisioned uh, will be constructed in phases that will be defined by the overall demand for service uh, and funding available for design and construction. 
The full build out of the facility will comprise up to five tracks and include a train wash, service and inspection facilities, as well as a pit, and up to three storage tracks that will be equipped with air and water connections for servicing, as well as electrical stations for trains to be powered uh, while being stored or serviced without the need for the locomotive item. Uh, the full build-out configuration will include a number of support buildings for parts and materials, workshops, a wheel profiling machine, maintenance of way, and offices for mechanical and operational personnel, and will provide up to 54 parking spaces for employees and visitors. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in addition to the project elements necessary to support the facility needs, uh, the project includes various landscape and active transportation elements to provide community benefits as well. Uh, the full build out to the project will include the design and construction of a bike and pedestrian trail from High Street to Francis Avenue, and will incorporate landscaping to provide a buffer zone between the facility and the residential and commercial developments directly adjacent to the project, as well as interpretive signage that will educate those traveling uh, the trail about the rich railroad heritage uh, of the area. Uh, next slide, please. So the project objectives uh, focus on expanding the servicing capabilities for the Pacific Surfliner and supported the expanded service goals uh, laid out in the 2018 California State Rail Plan, as well as our fiscal year 2022-23 annual business plan and the Los San Rail Corridor Optimization Study. The objectives include increasing the overnight layover and storage capacity on the north end of the Los San Rail Corridor, as well as improving operational efficiency and equipment utilization and minimizing or avoiding operational impacts to the Union Pacific Railroad, which is the owner, operator, and maintainer of the railroad uh, right away through this area. Uh, next slide. As mentioned earlier, uh, the project will be constructed in multiple phases based on service demand and available funding. The initial phase, uh, which does have funding through construct, design and construction right now, will include the two storage tracks and the, and the service and inspection facility, some civil site features, including paving, lighting, fencing, and temporary offices, as well as the landscape improvements, bike and pedestrian trail, and historical interpretive signage uh, for the area directly adjacent to the portions of the maintenance facility that will be constructed as part of this phase. The later phases will include the train wash, wheel profiling machine, permanent buildings, the remaining storage tracks, and completion of the landscaping and trail to Francis Avenue. Uh, next slide. In the development of the environmental impact report, the LOSAN agency is the designated lead agency for the project and has principal responsibility uh, for carrying out and approving the project under the California Environment Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. As part of the initial studies and project development, the preliminary reviews performed on the location and physical site conditions led us to determine that preparation of an environmental impact report, or EIR, uh, was necessary to, in, in order to review and address any possible significant impacts on the environment. Per the CEQA guidelines, as part of the EIR, environmental impacts and mitigation were identified, as well as issues to be resolved during the environmental review. We also posted both the draft and recirculated draft EIR for the required 45-day public review periods. Following the public review periods, we responded to comments and modified the environmental document and supporting documents as appropriate before producing a final EIR that, as mentioned a little while ago, will be presented to the Low Sand Board of Directors next Tuesday, December 6th, for certification and adoption of the findings, statement of overriding consideration, and the mitigation monitoring and reporting program. Uh, next slide, please. This slide summarizes some of the stakeholder coordination efforts for the project over the past three years. Beginning with the project kickoff meeting uh, held in July 2019 uh, in San Luis Obispo with SLOCOG, Amtrak, and the city of San Luis Obispo, and including the three-day design charrette for the facility master plan that was held in July 2020 with various city of San Luis Obispo departments and members of the city council, as well as other stakeholders that included Caltrans, Amtrak, and Union Pacific. 
the notice of preparation and public scoping period uh, was held in February 2021, and the first 45-day public comment period was held in November and December of 2021. This, concluded, this included a uh, public workshop as part of the City of San Luis Obispo Planning Commission meeting held on December 8th, uh, 2021. In May of 2022, staff recommended the postponement of the EIR certification so that we could further evaluate concerns raised by the city and local air pollution control district and revise the EIR as appropriate. Uh, this led to a second 45-day public review period for the recirculated draft EIR in September and October of this year. Uh, there were approximately 24 public comments uh, received during this period and written responses to those who provided comments were distributed on November 22nd. And as mentioned, uh, we will be taking the final EIR to the LOSAN board for certification next Tuesday. Uh, next slide, please. This slide summarizes the environmental topics evaluated as part of the Environmental Impact Report technical studies. Uh, the highlighted topics reflect those for which concerns were raised by the City of San Luis Obispo and the local Air Pollution Control, control District in uh, May. Uh, and this led to these topics being further evaluated and the technical studies being updated as necessary for the recirculated draft EIR. Several of the highlighted topics were also identified as posing significant impacts to the environment. And to address these impacts, mitigation measures were identified to reduce all but one impact to less than significant. Uh, one impact that remained significant was for cultural resources and the unavoidable impacts to the Southern Pacific Roundhouse and rail yard site. Uh, next slide, please. The next several slides present the mitigation measures identified to reduce the identified environmental impacts to a determination of less than significant. For air quality, the significant impact identified is related to the generation of dust, toxins, and other air pollutants during construction and operations of the facility. The mitigation measures identified for this impact include the preparation of a construction valley fever plan, development of control measures to minimize the amount of naturally occurring asbestos in the air, uh, development of measures to reduce overall dust to limit idling of construction equipment during construction. Um, mitigation measures identified to help reduce the generation of greenhouse gas emissions uh, include transitioning the Pacific Surf Liner fleet over to renewable diesel. This is something we are already actively working on at a statewide level and actually hope to implement or at least begin implementing this next spring. Uh, other mitigation measures include the purchase of GHG emission offsets as part of the full build out part uh, of the project and the installation of solar panels uh, for the facility, again, as part of the full build out phase of the project. Next slide. Uh, there are also the potential for significant impacts to archeological resources, uh, but with full time monitoring during all ground disturbing construction activities, and the preparation of a monitoring and discovery plan, uh, this impact it, it was reduced to less than significant. Uh, mitigation measures were also necessary for noise. However, by employing uh, noise reducing measures during construction, preparing a community notification plan for construction activities, preparing a specific operations plan that includes limitations and restrictions, uh, for operations in and around the facility and implementing an ongoing noise monitoring program, the noise impacts were also reduced to less than significant. Uh, next slide. Uh, biological impacts uh, identified include potential impacts to migratory and nesting birds. Uh, to help mitigate these potential impacts, we will conduct a pre-construction survey and implement exclusionary buffer zones around nesting birds as necessary as part of the construction. Uh, and for wetlands, uh, there are potential impacts to two small patches within the project area that may qualify uh, as wetlands. And to address this potential impact, uh, mitigation measures identified include conducting a formal jurisdictional delineation prior to construction to really determine the agency uh, responsible and to establish, if necessary, compensatory mitigation to ensure the project results in no net loss of wetlands uh, for the area. Uh, next slide, please. 
So as mentioned earlier, there was one significant and unavoidable impact identified for the project, uh, which relates to the cultural and historical resource that is the Southern uh, Pacific Roundhouse and Rail Yard site. While the Roundhouse Foundation and remnants of the Rail Yard site will be preserved to the extent feasible, an interpretive signage uh, will be placed for public viewing uh, along the publicly accessible bike and pedestrian trail. Significant portions of the Roundhouse and Rail Yard site are unavoidable and would be significantly impacted by the project. Uh, next slide, please. So overall, the findings for the EIR found that the majority of significant impacts will be avoided or lessened uh, to a level of less than significant with the implementation of the mitigation measures, with one significant and unavoidable impact to the cultural resources related to the former Southern Pacific Roundhouse and Rail Yard site. Uh, next slide, please. The final step in the EIR process will be to present to the board on Tuesday and recommend certification of the document along with approval of the CEPA finding and statement of override uh, emitting a reporting program. Uh, next slide, please. Assuming the board certifies the EIR on Tuesday, uh, the next steps are to begin the design of the initial phase. The recommendation for award of the design contract went to the board on November 15th, and that contract is currently in negotiation. Notice to proceed for final design is anticipated in February of 2023, with completion needed uh, in March of 2024, after which we will bid out the construction work which should begin in late 2024 or early 2025 and last approximately 12 to 18 months. Um, and this concludes my, my update on the Central Coast Labor Facility and I'm happy to answer any questions. Hey, James, Danny Vay here with Sandag. Um, is, um, and th thanks for the update. I very informative um, and I'm glad we are moving forward with the design um, uh, contract work um, as we're simultaneously getting this uh, CEQA document approved. Um, is there any or do you, do you expect any um, opposition at the at the board meeting or has everything kind of been worked out? That there is the potential uh, for the in fact, it's a high probability that the city will uh, make comments there. Uh, we have had uh, some initial discussions uh, with the city um, already and have another one actually planned prior to the, the board meeting to try and work through any remaining concerns they may have to at least give them a level of confidence. But I do fully expect regardless that they will actually uh, submit public comments uh, for the meeting. Okay, and maybe you can just um, highlight some of the. I, I mean, I know you've you've been meeting with the city, and if there's, um, it just I think it'd be helpful to recognize all the work because we we had this on a board agenda what like six nine months ago, and um, we um, decided to pull it, not take action, and there's a lot of work happening behind the scenes. So just um, just make sure we highlight that because. Um, I find oftentimes uh, boards may get confused or um, unsure if there's any opposition. So just make make sure we we highlight that you know we have that at least Losan has tried to address most of the issues. No, I, I do appreciate that, and we have been uh, working to set up board briefings also to make sure that uh, the board is aware with a lot of the other details that have gone into a lot of this work over the last several months. Uh, prior to the, the board meeting and the discussions that will ensue there. But I do appreciate that. And, and you're right. Uh, we have over the last, it was May uh, board meeting that we originally were going to take it to. And since that time, uh, through the summer, working to update the technical uh, studies as it related to primarily GHG, uh, because we also did receive uh, a comment letter from the local air pollution control district about that. Uh, so we went uh, in an abundance of caution and we assessed that um, addressing some of the uh, concerns that were presented. 
Uh, we did get a letter back from the Air Pollution Control District uh, indicating that they were satisfied with our changes, which is good. Um, and we also took the opportunity, since we were having to recirculate uh, elements of the EIR, to kind of clarify and tighten up some of the language that had been uh, presented as a concern from the city uh, initially there. So we're hoping we've addressed most of those to the extent that we are able to, um, and we can move ahead with this project and a certification. All right, are there any other questions? All right, uh, hearing none from the TAC. Michelle, do we have any requests from the public on this item? To comment in real time, please select raise hand to speak. If you're calling in by phone, please press star nine to raise your hand. No comments, James. All right, thank you. That was relatively painless. Uh, so this takes us to item number six. Uh, Pacific Surfliner marketing update, and uh, this item will be presented to the committee by Ms. Pooja Thomas Patel, OSAN's uh, manager of marketing and communications. So I believe Pooja, uh, it's uh, your presentation. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pooja Thomas Patel, and as James mentioned, I am the marketing and communications manager for LOSAN. And I'm here to present the Q1 marketing update for the Pacific Surfliner. Um, marketing program. This update is for the period between July 1st of 2022 to September 30th of 2022. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so Q1 saw a steady increase in sales and revenue um, as reported by PacificSurfliner.com, uh, especially um, as compared to the previous period. Uh, we saw increases across the board in website visits, referrals, bookings, ridership, and revenue. Next slide. So here you can see our year-over-year -year performance for Q1. We're showing you the past four years, so you can, um, at a glance, observe um, how we've done kind of pre-pandemic, through pandemic, and um, how we are doing now. Uh, we have come a long way from our early pandemic dip. Um, next slide. So um, getting into our marketing activities for Q1, um, unfortunately, we don't uh, get a lot of customer data from Amtrak, uh, which makes it very difficult for us to create targeted marketing programs, um, addressing you know, the needs or barriers or motivations, really understanding what our customers want. So um, our first order of business this year was um, to collect some data to understand our customers. We, uh, so we deployed a, a passenger survey to learn about who's riding our trains, um, what they like, what they dislike about the Pacific Surfliner service, why they're riding, and just really to understand who our customers are at the moment. Um, and we, as we had in the past for the cafe car survey, uh, we gave away a coupon for the cafe car as an incentive to complete our survey, we received over 4,000 responses. Um, and here are a few of our findings. Um, so we asked them, what are the main reasons you choose to ride the train for this trip? And the highest response was to be able to relax or to not drive. Um, we asked how many trips have you taken on the Pacific Surfliner in the past 12 months? So a majority of our, of our travelers at the moment are people who are either traveling for the first time or who um, are traveling for the first time in the past 12 months. We do have um, a decent amount of people who are frequent travelers at about 15%. And then we have um, the people who are, you know, occasional repeat riders who ride two to five times a year uh, who fall right in the middle. Uh, and then we also asked, uh, what do you dislike about the Pacific Surfliner service? And I'm happy to say that the overwhelmingly high response was nothing. Uh, we do have some folks who, um, you know, have disliked the delays or seats and other things. Um, but this this was this was reassuring and nice. Um, and lastly, um, on this presentation, we uh, you can see that we asked what the most important amenities are for um, for our service, and power outlets took the top spot, followed by Wi-Fi 
the market cafe, the business class snack box and drink, checked baggage, uh, business class pastries and coffee, and the pet program. Next slide, please. Um, for our advertising efforts during Q1, um, we um, started with a Summer of Fun campaign with KDOC, where we reached out to three of our CVB partners across the corridor. So we worked with San Diego, Anaheim, and San Luis Obispo. So KDOC visited each location to create a fun video that was broadcast on the TV network. Um, we have those videos available on our website as well. We did some broadcast advertising during PGA golf games. And um, in September, we participated with the Amtrak Fall Flash Sale and sold 383 tickets. Next slide. Um, in Q1, we also worked on some really exciting updates, at least exciting to me, updates on our website. Uh, we added translations to Spanish translations to the site through a service called WeGlots that allows us to quality control the translations. Um, so if you go to PacificSurfLiner.com and you look at the bottom right hand corner, you will see little icon flags where you can switch the language in which you access our website. Yeah. Currently, we're at English or Spanish. Um, and we will be looking into adding additional languages in the future. Um, we have been working on doing some A-B tests on our website's destination page. So we're serving up three different versions of the site at random currently. Um, and so we're looking at how we can um, help our customers understand our route better and how uh, what type of a destination page helps them engage better, helps us um, get more clicks on our booking widget, helps us get more conversions. And so we have three different tests running. You can see two here. So on the top, you can see we have a hero image and a little line map below it. Um, and then on the bottom, you can see we have a line map that is makes up our hero image. And then there is a third control option, which is neither of the maps showing, which is kind of what our website was before that. Um, and we'll bring the results to you um, when our pilot, when our tests have completed. Uh, but so far, the results are showing that people really like to engage with um, our destinations and the line map at the very top in our hero image. Um, and lastly, we, um, oh, I'm sorry, not lastly, uh, we worked on a lot of content um, to add to our website. We worked on um, blog posts, new web pages. We added one about ticket types. We are um, filling in trip inspiration content for our station pages, adding landing pages for each of our advertising campaigns. So we're able to track clicks and conversions for each. And then um, we also worked with Capital Corridor and San Joaquin's to jointly purchase the Amtrak California website domain, so amtrakcalifornia.com. Our trains um, still say Amtrak California on them. They have that branding on them. And um, we didn't own this domain, but we were getting a decent amount of kind of search traffic and referral from the search term. So now we jointly own this domain and we will be setting up the website to redirect to all three of our sites. Next slide. Um, some events from Q1 include we did a virtual town hall for the University of California Strip, University of California staff with Amtrak and the other two JPAs. Um, this was a really well attended event with 450 attendees, um, and they found the information. Uh, they were very satisfied with the information that they received during that. We participated in a four day rail safety event organized by Amtrak and Operation Lifesaver. Um, our administrative officer, Roger Ro Lopez, spoke at the press conference. And following that, there was an event for first responders and a two day event open to the public. We, um, as part of our Angels partnership, we have the opportunity to host a table at one of their games annually, and we typically pass this opportunity on to Operation Lifesaver, which we did again this year, um, to give them the opportunity to emphasize the importance of their work and reach a, a large audience and help them gain additional visibility during Rail Safety Month. Um, and then we also, oh, actually, next slide, talk about a little more about the Angels. So speaking of the angels, we have some data for our full year of sponsorship to share with you. The promotional events were, uh, the promotional emails were pretty successful. Um, they mailed our information out to over 300K subscribers twice, and we had 45% open rates and received about 1,000 clicks in each case. 
Um, our homepage takeover, uh, we're slightly less successful. Um, and then along with our digital products, which allow us to really track um, clicks and our visibility, um, we do have um, other products that we get from this partnership. So um, we get radio ads, which hundreds of radio ads playing throughout the year, throughout the region, um, LED um, signs in the outfield, um, billboards and commercial airtime on Bally Sports West. So um, really a full comprehensive package with the it with the angels that just concluded with this season next Thank slide you. um we have recently started a sponsorship with the la kings this is a digital campaign on the king's website and social media channels and um we're testing two different messages we just really want to understand um what resonates better with our king's hockey audience so we're testing two messages to try to understand uh, what would be um, better for this audience. So right now it's Explore SoCal by train or tailgate on the train, and we'll monitor how those two options work for us. Um, next slide. We have also started a year-long partnership with college sports to reach sports fans and college students. Uh, you will remember that we have a student discount available for our college students as well. It's 15%. And we've created dynamic landing pages for each university, um, and we'll be giving away a free ticket uh, on the train at each of the 24 games that we will be sponsoring. Next slide. Uh, so during Q1 um, for social media, we worked on travel tips for Comic-Con, did some educational posts for Rail Safety Month, provided timely updates on service adjustments, and posted about trip ideas, amenity highlights, special offers. You can see some of our example posts. And next slide. We also wanted to share some of our social media metrics with you. Um, so if you look in the second column, uh, you will see that we had an increase in followers for the top, the three of the four channels. We also had an increase in followers for TikTok, um, but they don't allow us to break up the data by quarters. So unfortunately, we can't give you exactly the number of growth that we had um, during that time, but definitely positive overall for our social media metrics. Next slide. And then um, Comic-Con and Del Mar races are kind of our big Q1 events, and we typically do a lot of communications around these. So this year we included, that included a press release, station signage, social media communications, blog posts, messaging, on the added service, we also had staff assisting passengers at the stations, and uh, we received press coverage from 267 outlets and over had over 136 million media impressions for those two events. Next slide. Um, so I've shared with you before that we are working with Caltrans and the other JPAs on a ridership pilot. This is based on the research um, from credit card data that, Cal that Caltrans purchased to help us understand the personas of people who live around each of our stations. And we have identified Santa Barbara now as our pilot location, and um, we will be conducting focus groups shortly. So for this pilot, uh, we'll be working with what's called a buildup incentive, which is based on the behavioral science concept of gradient theory, where uh, we'll be working with our target audience to accrue milestones to give them an incentive. The goal is to see what it takes for families to take repeat trips on the Pacific Surfliner. So the focus group will give us more insights into how specifically to structure this pilot, what the messaging should be, what the incentive should be. So we'll be testing all of this with the focus group um, and then creating the specific pilot uh, the, uh, following the focus groups. Um, next slide. And then um, for passenger communications during Q1, we were focused on the potential work stoppage that would have occurred that would um, would have occurred in September. Um, the track closure that uh, occurred on the very last day of Q1, um, and just getting messaging out about slow orders in Orange County, service updates, and um, other um, events that were happening in Q1. Next slide. And then, um, so Jason wanted me to share with you a bit of news about a project that we have recently implemented. So this is a current project, not Q1. 
Um, we worked with Amtrak to implement cross-domain conversion tracking for our Google ads. And this basically what this means is that um, so all, our tickets are actually, uh, so if someone comes to our website to purchase a ticket, they click on what's called a booking widget and then they're taken over to the Amtrak website. The purchase actually occurs on the Amtrak website. So without conversion tracking in place, we can't see who actually ends up buying a ticket. So they can come to our, our website, they can come to our ad, and then we lose them um, and we don't know how they actually behave after that. And so with conversion tracking in place, um, if they click on one of our Google ads um, and then they go over to Amtrak, we actually get the information back to see, oh, they purchased a ticket um, and how much that ticket, uh, what the value of that ticket was. And so we have Google ads running now that conversion tracking is in place. And we have three different campaigns. The first campaign is des destination based. So uh, we're showing different popular destinations across our route. And um, the second campaign is a general brand campaign. And our last campaign is a seniors focused campaign. And um, we've only had this campaign in place for about a month, but we're seeing really great initial results. Our destination based campaign is giving us um, uh, $13 for every dollar spent for a brand based campaign. It's, I'm sorry, the general, yeah, the brand based campaign is $21 for every dollar spent. Our seniors campaign is our not as successful, um, but it is still a positive ROI where we're seeing a dollar fifty for every dollar spent. So spent the really positive results so far for our Google Ads. So um, we'll keep you posted on how these go in the long term. And next slide. Lastly, looking ahead, um, we wanted to tell you about what um, we have on our agenda uh, over the next month or so. So we'll be working on communications for the contextual work stoppage. It looks like just about an hour ago, the Senate um, took some action, so this may not be moving forward. Um, having some communication or communicate, continuing to communicate about the track closure, holiday travel communications, our KPCC radio ads um, have been on hold since our um, track closure, so we'll be resuming those um, shortly. We are also looking to sponsor high school sports, um, mainly girls and boys basketball and volleyball. I think it also includes cheerleading and then um, the ridership pilot that I mentioned earlier will launch shortly as well. And um, that's it for me. I'm happy to answer questions. All right, thank you, Pooja. Do we have any uh members of the TAC that have any questions on the marketing update? I think I see one for Claire. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for noting that about the, uh, the strike because I just looked it up right now. So that looks to be good news. Um, I just had a question about the uh, marketing for the universities. Uh, my question is: It you know specifically related to sports only? Are you looking to uh, partner in general with the CSUs or in the um, UCs or private schools, or just kind of um, more about that program and its intent? I'd be happy to help um, on our end as well. But I was just curious about that. Yeah, um, it's a partnership that we, it's a sponsorship, I should say, that we are doing through our um, sports marketing vendor. Um, and it's uh, a company that um, works with a group of colleges. Um, Michelle, if you can go back to that slide, um, the colleges that are part of the program um, are a combination of CSUs and UCs. Um, so it's Cal Poly Slow, UC Santa Barbara, CSUN, CSULB, um, UCLA, Cal State Fullerton, UCI, and UCSD. Um, and it's it's just part of this package that um, we've uh, worked with in the past as well. Great, thank you. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, re reaching out to colleges is, is great. And so if you expand on uh, this, you know, outreach to colleges in general beyond the sports too, we'd be happy um, to help as well and would be very supportive of that. Sounds so great, yeah. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Aaron. Hi, thank you. And thank you, Pooja, for another great presentation. Um, I was excited to see about the Santa Barbara Station and look forward to working with you all on that. I'd also like to learn more a little bit about the return on investment for that targeted marketing. Um, so if it's possible, maybe we could follow up and get some, some additional data. It was 
uh, encouraging to see Venturas, uh, Santa Barbara, and San Luis Obispo, the north section, um, so prominently uh, identified there. So just um, encouraged by that and would like to learn more. Um, to, to be fair, we are focusing um, on the northern part of our corridor only at the moment because we have a track closure on the southern part of our corridor. Um, so all of our resources are currently um, being spent um, on the northern part of the corridor. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll pretend that it's <laughs> I, I, I'll, yeah. I'll pretend that it's uh, it's indicative of how great we are up here in the north. I mean, Santa Barbara really is one of our top referrals. We we definitely um, get a lot of website traffic from Santa Barbara. A lot of people searching, um, and we we do we yes, it's it's definitely um, up there, regardless of where we're spending our dollars. Great, thank you. All right. Any other members of the TAC have questions uh, on the marketing update? It's seeing none. Uh, Michelle, do we have any uh, requests from the public on this item? To comment in real time, please select raise hand to speak. If you're calling in by phone, press star nine to raise your hand. No comments, James. All right, thank you. Uh, so that brings us to item number seven, uh, Pacific Surfliner on-time performance analysis for first quarter of fiscal year 2022-23. And as always, this item will be presented to the TAC by Ms. Rosa Guillen Sanchez, Los Angeles Senior Transportation Analyst. Hi, James, thank you. I can't see myself, can everyone see me? I can see you, Rosa. Okay, great, thank you. So again, I'm Rosa Guillen Sanchez, Senior Transportation Analyst under Low Sand Planning and Analysis. And I'm here to present to you the quarter one of fiscal year 2023 on-time performance analysis, which covers the months of July, August, and September, 2022. Next slide, please. So the map here shows the Pacific Surfliner route and the location of its four host railroads, Union Pacific or UP is shown in green. Southern California Regional Rail Authority, or SERA, is shown in purple. Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad, or BNSF, is shown in blue. And North County Transit District to the south, or NCTD, is shown in red. Next slide. Slide three shows average system-wide endpoint on-time performance, which is the metric low sand is required to report to the state. And the 90% endpoint OTP goal, shown in red, is set by CalSTA. For reference, the chart shows historical performance going back to July 2019. But for the three months of fiscal year 23, quarter one, endpoint OTP averaged 74.6%. And please note that while the track closures due to the San Clemente emergency were implemented on September 30th, there were already precautionary slow orders that were negatively impacting OTP in that area since August. Next slide, please. Slide four shows how OTP was calculated for quarter one and the previous quarter based on the total number of trains arriving on time out of the total number of trains operated. Next slide, please. Slide five shows average monthly customer on-time performance. This metric measures the on-time arrival of every passenger, including those who detrain at intermediate stops, as well as those who ride until the end of the train trip. The 76% goal shown in red is set by Amtrak. And we do not report this OTP metric to the state as part of our uniform performance measures, but we show it here as information. Next slide, please. Slide six shows historic system-wide ridership by month. In summary, ridership is of course still low compared to pre-COVID levels, but as the three month moving average trend line shows here, ridership in quarter one was trending upward compared to the previous quarter. And as we know, higher ridership does tend to increase passenger-related delays. Next slide, please. On slide seven, the main chart with the three colors shows minutes of delay by a responsible party per 10,000 train miles. Using this rate metric allows us to compare periods with different levels of Pacific Surfliner service. As you may recall, we usually categorize delays into one of three responsibility groups, host, Amtrak or third party. System wide, post responsible delays shown in yellow continue to be the largest category of delay type, followed by Amtrak related delays 
shown in blue, then third party shown in the bright green. While delay rates for third party improved from quarter four to quarter one, they increased for Amtrak and host resulting in an overall 18.9% increase in the delay rate. In the next slide, I'll provide more details. Next slide, please. Slide eight shows the breakdown of the previous slide. Here, the delay categories are broken down by individual delay type. The top three individual delay types in fiscal year 23 quarter one were all under the yellow host responsible delay category. Number one was signal delays. Number two was passenger train interference. And number three was commuter train interference. Notably, passenger related delays shown in blue, which are under Amtrak, increased and were the number four individual delay type system wide. Now, since the host responsible delay types account for the largest share of delays, they were 71% in quarter one, as the pie chart shows. In the next slide, I'll show you a further breakdown by location. Next, please. Each host territory location is unique and has its own pattern of challenges. Slide nine shows three charts showing only host responsible delays per 10,000 train miles by host railroad. Focusing on the top chart, you can see that overall in quarter one, the host responsible delay rate increased across all four territories. Now, by comparing the middle chart showing older fiscal year 22 quarter four data to the bottom chart showing more recent fiscal year 23 first quarter data, you can see how each specific delay type changed quarter over quarter by host location. On the bottom chart showing quarter one data, you can see that signal issues not only remain the top delay type with the new P territory, but they increase significantly from quarter four to quarter one. Related again to the ongoing shunting issue where the rails are not always detecting moving trains properly. As a reminder, the rail infrastructure and UP territory is largely single track, which exacerbates any delay issue. And as we discussed during our last meeting to address the shunting issue, UP has been operating a rail scrubbing machine every week as frequently as possible to remove the rust from the rails and improve signal detection. Also to ameliorate the delay impact and improve schedule reliability in quarter one, a schedule adjustment was implemented on July 11th so that train 594, the last train that was operating out of LA, began departing 15 minutes later. Now, moving down south in SERA or Metrolink territory, the top delay type remained passenger train interference. In BNSF territory, the highest delay rates were under signal delays, freight train interference, and slow orders. In NCTD territory, the number one delay type continues to be commuter train interference. Next, please. Slide 10 shows where there were peaks of delay minutes around stations or other specific locations along the Pacific Surfliner route, from UP territory shown in green to NCTD territory shown in red. This is system-wide data. It's not the same rate metric I've shown in the previous slides, and it shows the sum of delays for all trains combined during quarter one. Overall, total minutes of delay system-wide increased by 21%, from about 64,000 minutes in fiscal year 22 quarter four to nearly 78,000 minutes in quarter one of fiscal year 23. The top three delay locations in quarter one were Oceanside Station, CP West Soto located between Fullerton and LAUS and Carpinteria in UP territory. Note that Carpinteria has not been historically one of the top three specific delay locations but this time it doubled from quarter four to quarter one. And this was largely attributed to the ongoing signal issues in that area. Next slide, please. The table on the left of slide 11 shows the average endpoint OTP scores of individual Pacific Surfliner trains during quarter one. Focusing on the column with the green to red color scale, you can see that one train in dark green achieved an OTP score above the 90% goal. The lowest performing train was 777, 
with an average OTP score of 22% in quarter one. To help illustrate how major incidents or delays can cascade through an entire day of service, for reference, the gray box on the right shows the daily equipment turn patterns of Pacific Surfliner trains in quarter one. As I've mentioned the example before, just referencing the top row, you can see that each morning northbound train 562 traveled from LA to San Diego, then turned in San Diego to become train 573, then turned again in LA and so forth until it ended the day as southbound train 594. The point is that any major delay accumulated by a single train is not only likely to impact the OTP of that train, other trains operating in its track vicinity in that hour, but can also impact trains operating system-wide hours later. In the next slide, I'll show you which trains accumulated the most minutes of delay in quarter one. Next, please. Slide 12 shows total minutes of delay incurred by each train during all trips in quarter one by delay type. Note that this includes minutes of delays that trains may have recovered from before arriving to their endpoint stations. The multitude of bar, bars and colors illustrates the complexity of delays experienced by trains operating across the corridor. The tallest bar represents northbound train 777, which usually traverses the entire corridor on a long eight hour and 45 minute journey from San Diego to San Luis Obispo. Now, if we focus on the bar colors that stand out the most from the previous slides, we know that the top delay issue system-wide were signal delays, shown in blue on this chart, passenger train interferences, shown in yellow, commuter train interferences, shown in bright green, general passenger-related delays, shown in hot pink here, plus delays specifically related to assisting passengers with disabilities, which are shown in brown. On this chart, you can see how much these specific delay types impacted each train system-wide. These five delay types alone accounted for over two thirds of all delays in quarter one. Next, please. In summary, endpoint OTP for fiscal year 23 quarter one, covering the months of July through September, 2022, averaged 74.6%, which is below the 90% goal set by CalSTA. Most delay types continue to fall under the host responsibility category, followed by Amtrak, then third party. The overall delay rate increased by 18.9% from quarter four to quarter one. As I've explained, we can attribute the increased delay rate to a number of reasons, but signal delays, train traffic, more passengers along the corridor, and the precautionary slow orders around San Clemente were the top delay root causes from July through September 2022. Again, to try to alleviate some of the issues and improve schedule reliability in quarter one, UP had been operating a rail scrubbing machine and a small schedule adjustment was implemented in July. Moreover, now emergency track stabilization work is ongoing in Southern San Clemente. And I'll discuss more about that in a future presentation on fiscal year 23, quarter two, which will cover the months of October through December 2022. This concludes my quarter one presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, as always, Rosa. Any TAC member have uh, any questions for Rosa? No, quite thorough. You left them speechless, Rosa. Um, all right. Uh, Moving on then, uh, Michelle, do we have any requests from the public on this item? To come in in real time, please select raise hand to speak. If you're calling in by phone, press star nine to raise your hand. No comments, James. All right, thank you. All right, this brings us to item number eight, upcoming draft board agenda items. Uh, this is an overview of upcoming agenda items for the December 6, 2022 Los San Real Quarter Agency Board of Directors meeting. The agenda includes most of the presentations and updates given to this committee today for consideration and discussion, 
as well as the quarterly grants, budget status, and system safety and incident reports. Uh, we're also taking a status report of state legislation enacted in 2022 and a draft uh, 2023 agency legislative program. There will be two procurement items related to website design and videography and photography services. And we'll also be requesting uh, the board certify and approve the final environmental uh, impact report, CEQA findings of fact, and statement of overriding considerations, as well as the mitigation monitoring and reporting program for the Central Coast Layer Facility in San Luis Obispo. Uh, this concludes my summary, and I'm happy to answer any clarifying questions uh, members may have on the agenda. Seeing none, Michelle. James, oh. Danny Vay here yeah. with Sandag. Um, looking at the upcoming board agenda, I didn't see, maybe I missed it, an update on uh, San Clemente, because um, I know, <clears throat> I think there was going to be at some point in maybe mid-December, where there could be a potential decision on when service could be restored. I'm just wondering if um, the board can get an update. Uh, that is actually not planned because there really isn't any additional information on the board. When there is some at the last minute, we do be, uh, we are uh, trying to send out uh, memos to the boards and agency uh, member agencies there. Uh, but at this time, there has been no change in the proposed schedule uh, and work at, than what was presented by OCTA at the November 15th meeting. Okay. If that does change, like I said, we'll make sure that we send out uh, memos to not only the board members, but the member agencies updating them on uh, those changes. All right. Any additional questions from the TAC? Hearing none, Michelle, do we have any requests from the public on this item? To comment in real time, please select raise hand to speak. If you're calling in by phone, press star nine to raise your hand. No comments, James. All right, thank you. This takes us to, I guess, uh, item number nine, which is the uh, Los San Real Corridor Agency update. Um, I do have a couple things to uh, items I'd like to briefly update the TAC on. Um, while the preliminary Thanksgiving ridership data is still being analyzed uh, to try and reduce potential duplication due to the multiple transfers we're now seeing on our, our service there of rail, bus, and rail, uh, the data does suggest that roughly 30,000 passengers took the Surfliner service uh, Thanksgiving week. Uh, and considering the track closure uh, still in effect, this is a very positive uh, ridership number that we're, we're very pleased with there. Uh, and then also regarding the potential rail strike and some late breaking news that Pooja mentioned in, in her update, this afternoon the Senate voted on three items related to the potential strike. Uh, these items included an extension of negotiations for another 60 days, as well as adding seven days of paid sick leave, and uh, to also impose the tentative agreement negotiated in September. The first two items did not have enough votes to pass, but the Senate did vote to approve the tentative agreement that was also approved by the House yesterday. Uh, the legislation will now be sent to the president for signature and assuming it is signed, the rail strike uh, would be averted. Uh, where the strike to have occurred, however, staff had been working with Amtrak uh, to plan for limited bus service. Uh, to provide some service along the entire corridor until such time as rail service could be restored. But I'm thankful uh, that we did, it does not look like we will have to implement that additional contingency plan. Uh, that concludes my updates. Uh, I'm happy to answer any question, clarifying questions on, on these items um, or if there's any other uh, LOSAN um, uh, agency staff that have any updates they want to uh, provide, please do so now as well. All right. Hearing no comments from the TAC, uh, Michelle, do we have any requests from the public on this item? 
to come in in real time, please raise hand to speak. If you're calling in by phone, press star nine to raise your hand. No comments, James. All right. Well, that takes us to item number 10 then and TAC member uh, reports. Uh, this time we'll start from the north end of the corridor and start with Slowcog. And Mr. Gillen, is there any updates from Slowcog? Uh, thanks, James. Uh, actually, I have no comment and no updates. All right. Thank you. You bet. Uh, SBK. I believe Aaron said he had to drop off for another meeting, but I'm not sure if anyone else from SBK was able to join. Hearing none. Uh, VCTC. James, uh, Aubrey Smith here. Um, just a quick update. We recently released an RFP for design and project management services for um, improvement to the Chem Rail station related to um, ADA. So that is out right now and we're looking to get proposals back in mid-December. Um, that's it. All right, thank you. Metro. Uh, no updates here at this point, James. OCTA? No report. Thank you, James. RCTC? Yeah, just a quick report. We uh, just submitted our Chrissy grant for the Coachella Valley Rail Project. Uh, so with a little luck, we'll get some funding to take it to the next phase. But I appreciate everyone who provided letters of support. And we look forward to this process moving forward. Thanks. Thank you, Sheldon. NCTV? Um, not too much to update. Uh, we are hosting our Holiday Express service over the next two weekends, uh, which is a special train between Oceanside Transit Center and Solana Beach. So if you've got any special items on your wish list this season, you can find Santa at Oceanside Transit Center. Good to know. I want a stable rail corridor. Did you give those out? <laughs> First on the list. <laughs> uh, sand egg. Just gonna put uh, Tim on the spot to give us an update on grants. We work on several grants. If Tim's there. Yeah, no problem, Danny. So um, we submitted a local partnership program grant through the state for the East Brook to Shell uh, bridge replacement and double track project on Tuesday. Uh, we're also submitting a Chrissy grant um, in process today for um, the Sorrento to Miramar phase two, which is another double tracking project uh, in the San Diego subdivision. And the last uh, low sand project uh, is the solutions for congested corridors, uh, the Batakitas Lagoon uh, bridge replacement and double track. So it's been a busy time for rail planning and um, getting grants for the uh, San Diego subdivision of the low sand corridor. All right. Thank you for that update. Um, MTS? No update for MTS. Now moving to SCAG. No update from SCAG, thanks. Thank you. High Speed Rail? Hey, James. Uh, some of you may know High Speed Rail is in the process of transitioning to a new project management team. So uh, likely starting next month, we'll have a new representative for this meeting and I'll email you the details when I get them. That's it. All right, thank you. Uh, Union Pacific. Just one small update. We completed a fifth out of sixth phase of CTC work uh, up to Guadalupe that leaves about 21 miles. 22 miles of uh, track to finish off in the spring. Um, I look forward to completing that project. All right. Uh, BNSF. I think Cindy said she had to drop off, but that Tamara was going to join, but it doesn't look like she was able to. Okay. Uh, Amtrak. 
Uh, no updates from Metrolink. All right, thanks, Tim. Metrolink. I think Rory, you're on still, right? All right. Okay, one second. Go ahead, Roger. No updates at this time, other than the fact that our arrow service is open for service. Okay. Uh, Great. Well, that's been a lot of planning. Um, and did, actually I realized that Alan Miller was in the attendees right there. Promote him real quick and see if there's any update from Caltrans. Okay. And uh, hearing none, that uh, I guess, uh, Michelle, do we have any requests from the public on this item? To come in in real time, please select raise hand to speak. If you're calling in by phone, press star nine to raise your hand. And James, nothing from Caltrans. Okay, there you are. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Took me a minute to find the mute button. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, that moves us to item number 11 and adjournment. And our, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, thank everyone for, for your participation today. Uh, the next regularly scheduled meeting since our calendar was approved uh, is scheduled to be held at 1.15 p.m. on Thursday, February 2nd, 2023 in person at the offices of the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority. And with that, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Hope everyone has a great rest of the day and a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, James. Thanks, James.